Hey, Dr. Alan Christensen here with you. Have you ever checked your lipoprotein A? If not, I'd love for you to do so, and here's why. So we know that there's some genetic tie between heart disease risks. If, if your family members have it, your risks are higher. But how do you know if you've gotten that risk or not? Well, lipoprotein A is the strongest genetic predictor. So when it's high, that means you did inherit some risk from, from the family. If it's lower, then you likely did not. Now, there's other names for this too. You might, you might see this called capital L, little p, little a in parentheses, or lipoprotein little a. You know, by, by default, I often just call it lipoprotein A. That's a simple thing in my head for whatever reason. And what it is, this is actually the molecule that carries uh, cholesterol, fats, and proteins through the bloodstream. It's, it includes LDL and it includes cholesterol molecules and brings them around. The molecule itself has some similarities with LDL also. It has a thing called apolipoprotein B, but it's different from LDL in that it also has apolipoprotein A. And testing for it, you know, any blood test, pretty much anywhere you would get blood tests done, can do lipoprotein A tests, but it's not part of routine screening. So when you get a general health screen, unless you ask for it specifically, it probably will not show up. It's not part of a routine cholesterol panel. There's different units on this. The most common ones are milligrams per deciliter, so I'll refer to those. But just know that nanomoles per liter are out there also. And just if you've had it tested and you want to compare what I'm saying here to your values, double check the actual units to make sure it's the same thing. If you're below 30 milligrams per deciliter, that's considered normal. If you're between 31 and 50, that's considered to be some high risk. And if you're greater than 50, that's considered to be very, very high risk. Now, this is fascinating for a lot of reasons, one of which is that it has nothing to do with your lifestyle. You know what I mean? Seriously, it doesn't matter if your diet is perfectly clean and it's like no, no fat, no cholesterol, or if it's all paleo, doesn't make any difference. Amer Amer American diet, too much food, too little food, none of these things have any significant bearing upon your lipoprotein A levels nor do your activity levels. You can be completely sedentary, you can be a marathoner, won't change your lipoprotein A. So who is affected by this? Well, many people are. It could be a big percent of the population. There was a recent story about a celebrity trainer from The Biggest Loser, uh, Bob Harper. It was a sad thing. I had seen him on Rachel Ray uh, a little while back, and he was just going on about the virtues of the paleo diet and butter coffee and how he, this had been such a great thing he'd been enjoying and feeling well with. And he was actually on the show mixing up butter coffee and telling Rachel Ray how this is the ultimate tonic, this is so good for you or whatnot. And sadly, a few months afterwards, he had a heart attack. And it was a type that's pretty much always fatal. The fact that he lived was just a, a wonderful collection of circumstances in terms of quick care and good hospital team, but he barely pulled through. He's come out now and argued that his lipoprotein A was one of the big culprits behind that. And he's got a new book talking about that and about his different approach now in terms of more about carbs being good. He even called it the super carb diet. So this can affect many people. Now, it can go up for women during menopause. That's one time where it will change. About 20% of people in general can find it elevated when they test for it. I've talked a bit before about the APOE gene, and some people that have the APOE2 gene probably have lower levels of lipoprotein A. Other versions of the APOE gene don't seem to affect that. Africans, African Americans, South Asians, they'll typically have higher levels of it as well. And if parents have it high, about half the time, kids will have it higher also. So what do you do about this? Well, first thing is just screen for it. And out of pocket, if your insurance won't cover it, it's not crazy, you know, 40 to $70. It's not something you've got to test over and over and over and over again, because it won't change a lot, good or bad. So if you find that it's normal, and you're a man, or you're a woman who's postmenopausal, you don't really need to do further tests for it, maybe once a decade, but it's not likely to shift at all. If you're a woman who's menopausal or premenopausal, 
I would suggest testing annually until you're five years after menopause. And that's because it can shift, it can get higher with menopausal women. Now, there's really nothing we know of that lowers lipoprotein A. And that doesn't mean we can't do anything about it, and I'll talk about that. There's one exception called apheresis, and that's basically pulling it out of your blood. So extracting blood and removing the lipoprotein A from your blood. And that effect is just, just temporary. Really, it doesn't have any lasting effects on that. So think about lipoprotein A as a risk factor, as an amplifier of other cardiovascular risk factors, especially LDL cholesterol. So you can't change lipoprotein A, but if you have it high and you keep your LDL cholesterol really low, like below 70 total, then it seems there's not significant risk with lipoprotein A. Other factors that correlate with its risk include your blood pressure, your triglycerides, your glucose, and lifestyle factors. So exercise, stress reduction, Mediterranean diet. Now, the funny thing is, those things won't change your lipoprotein A scores. I want to make that clear. You can improve your cholesterol, your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your lifestyle, your stress load, and you won't influence lipoprotein A levels, but you can influence the risk that you have because of those levels. And that's the part that really matters the most. And it'd be nice if you could see exactly how much things are impacting it, but sadly it will not show up. Uh, monounsaturated fats may reduce it to some extent, perhaps 10 to 10 to 20 percent. Almonds also, same thing, maybe some reduction by about 10, 10 percent or so. In women who are menopausal, hormone replacement therapy may decrease it also by about 10 percent. And that's probably why we see more heart disease with women when they enter menopause, because lipoprotein A can elevate. Now, when it's extremely elevated, when it's really high, all those things above can be useful Niacin, this is a mixed bag here. Now before I was saying how a lot of those lifestyle factors could cut the risk but not reduce lipoprotein A. So niacin may lower lipoprotein A by 30%, but so far the bigger studies looking at the effects of that say it doesn't help the risk. And that's a really important point I want you to get, is that we have these markers that correlate with risk factors, and sometimes if you just like artificially force a marker up or down, you may not have an effect upon improving the risk. And that's the part that matters. That's the part that really makes a difference. Also, if it's extremely high, there's times to where aspirin therapy may be helpful for lowering the risk more so of stroke or coagulation issues. Um, vitamin C, there's been some arguments that higher doses of it may be useful. Not, not strong evidence. So if it is up, probably your number one goal would be to lower LDL cholesterol ideally below 70, 70 units. And how do you go about doing that? Well, there's, there's no one magic pill per se, but there's a lot of data about resistant starch. In fact, one 26 week long double blinded study. So really quality data, you know, it went on for a good period of time. They had people on diets that consumed resistant starch or did not, and it was completely blinded. So the researchers nor the participants knew who was on which. And what they saw was that the decrease of overall LDL cholesterol was greater than would have been expected on cholesterol-lowering medication. And the other side benefits that showed up from the study was that those on resistant starch had healthier insulin metabolism, they had improved glucose metabolism, and they had a better gut microbiome. So lots and lots of side corollary benefits showed up. And these are things that you know, good onto themselves, but also things that would correspondingly decrease the general risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, the studies like this often use amounts of resist resistant starch that are pretty tough to get in the diet. The biggest food sources of resistant starch are good foods to include, things like the beans, uh, legumes, especially the white beans, potatoes that are boiled, you know, underripe bananas or plantains. They're good foods to add in but the actual amount of resistant starch they give never approximates what we see in clinical trials like this. If you are concerned about your LDL levels, the Daily Reset Shake does have the full dose of resistant starch as found in clinical trials. Keep tabs on LDL cholesterol, watch your other risk factors, the blood pressure, the blood glucose, the blood sugar, 
and do a screen for lipoprotein A at least once. <laughs> if it's great and you're a male or you're postmenopausal, probably fine. If you're a woman who's still perimenopausal or menopausal, check it a few more times, make sure it's good. And if it's up, dial in those risk factors and you can really make a big difference. Take great care. We'll talk in really soon. Bye-bye.